The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen only. Hello, this is Barry Coons from Computer World. Uh, and I'm uh, joining Barry. I'm Anthony Charman from Computer World as well. Uh, so today we, uh, we're going to do uh, about an hour-long presentation about VMworld 2015. Yep. Uh, both Anthony and I went to VMworld with a number of our colleagues from Computer World and some customers as well. Um, and uh, the VM world was four to five days long, depending on uh, if you went for the partner bit and the additional bits at the end. And following that, we recently did an event called Find Tomorrow, which we tried to sum up what happened in those four to five days um, into to just about five to six hours. So today, we're going to take those five days and try and sum it up within an hour. Yep. And I think one of the things that um, uh, one of the guys from VMware said, he, he, you know, the event we ran in Bristol was apparently one of the largest VMworld follow-up events, so we were uh, pleased to hear that from them. Yeah, definitely. It's good to be recognised by VMworld. We've been doing the uh, events for a little while now, started with about five to six people around a table back at the old manor house when we were in our old offices, and, yeah. and to get to around 200 attendees was a fantastic achievement. Yeah. So I'm going to um, kick off just by explaining a little bit about uh, Computer World. I know some of you online will uh, know us already because you'll be existing clients of ours. Um, but some of them, uh, some people will be uh, new to Computer World. We've been in existence for about 25 years now. Um, we started off as an IT training company, realized that uh, the people we training, uh, were training needed to buy PCs, um, started selling PCs, uh, and that grew into servers. Um, and we've evolved into uh, a, a very strong consultancy around virtualization and around uh, a lot of other uh, kind of complementary areas with IT. Um, our mission statement here, which I think is, uh, um, I heard a mission statement once described as how a company explains uh, how little it knows about the industry in one sentence. Um, but uh, that's not the case here. We are really, uh, you know, we really uh, put some effort into this, and uh, what it says is is what we really mean. So, so for me, I mean, the, the elements there that are involved, the fact that it's passion, knowledge, and complete understanding and personal knowledge, that sums up what we do. We like to work with our customers, understand what your needs are, and then put our expert engineers in to, to help architect solutions and deliver and support solutions for our customers. Um, and that pulls into to the five pillars that that we have and. We don't dabble in technologies. We specialize in what we do. We have dedicated architects and uh, implementation support engineers for that. So I think it's really important that as we're going into this cloud era, you, you need to be mindful of the technologies that you are looking at for your business. And we've tried to pick that with the, the five technologies that are featured on screen. Yeah, so uh, each one of those areas there, we have uh, some really good solid and very experienced pre-sales engineers. Uh, who can come and work with your organization. The, the way that we work best as an organization is where we are complementing the existing skills you've got within your organization um, with our um, expertise and our subject matter uh, experts in, uh, in all of those areas um, to actually, you know, to help you design a solution, to help you implement then that, and then to uh, continue to help you to support that. So uh, our services uh, represent that, and uh, so we, the consultancy piece on the uh, generally on the front end of a, a design, our ongoing support, and then we uh, we know about the uh, importance of training um, on uh, you know to actually help you get the best out of the systems that we implement. And what's quite unique with inside Compute World's group of companies is the ability to also, if you're looking for the right staff, we obviously have a recruitment business, but the nature of what we can do is we can train the staff you're looking for. So if you can't find the member of the staff with all the right skills, but they've got the right personal skills, the things you really can't train, we, we are then able to deliver a member of staff for you that delivers all that together. Okay. So I, th I think that's it for the, the pitch of Compute World. We needed to just get a little bit in as to what we're doing, what we've changed which comes on to a little bit um, around the event and what we've been doing around our event. It, so it was called Define Tomorrow. Um, Define Tomorrow came about as a knowledge sharing site. We've got a lot of engineers that are, are very knowledgeable that are willing to share what they're doing. And we wanted to have a place where our customers could go to to find out the latest information, what was going on in the industry, um, how to, to solve problems within their infrastructure and look uh, and see and understand what technology was doing. Yeah. So uh, definetomorrow.co.uk came about. It's a blog, post, a blog page that you can get to any time. We're covering all the latest events. There's uh, articles there from VMworld. Uh, we were also at the UK VMUG uh, earlier on this week. We've got articles coming up from a uh, Microsoft event that we recently attended as well. Yeah. Um, so you can go there and leading on from that, we've also used that brand for our event as well. So if um, you want any more information or dig in some of these technologies, head over to findtomorrow.co.uk. 
So at our event, we had a, a number of different sponsors, um, like they do at VMworld. VMworld have a solutions exchange that features over 100 different vendors from the likes of HP, Dell, uh, Hitachi, but then also the newer people in the industry. And what something that I always kind of judge uh, how successful a company is doing is when they come in, they start with a small stand, one person yeah. stood next to a pull-up banner, and then over the years, they then go to the larger and larger stands in the show floor. Um, one of those, I suppose, was Nimble Storage. Four years ago, it was a couple of guys stood next to a, a pull-up banner, and now they, they had uh, quite a large stand with 20 or 30 staff on their stand. Yeah, one of the things I was going to pick up, coincidentally, is uh, another Nimble on there, which is... Uh, a company that we work alongside who do a uh, an online learning portal um, that we often implement as part of uh, a, a systems rollout just to deliver training to end users so they can log into there they can uh, watch the kind of introduction to their new workstation uh, video I'm thinking specifically if we're doing a, a VDI implementation um, but also we work with a number of insurance companies and pharmaceutical companies who need to put people through induction training and compliance training uh, and we've been using that nimble portal to uh, deliver that kind of training so it's really you know although we're a technology company um, we also understand the importance of, uh, of that training bit to complement what we do so we want to try and make this as interactive as possible as we get on to the, to the main content uh, we've got Megan here in the room as well so if you use the chat facility what we'll do at the end of the presentation any questions that you've got we'll try and go through those questions and hopefully answer for them for you or speak to your computer or account manager and we can answer them one to one so if we kind of look forward and, and uh, talk about VMworld 2015, I mean, for, for those that you don't know, VMworld has been going for, I believe it's nine or ten years now, yeah. uh, generally happens uh, twice a year in uh, the US and then in Europe. Uh, this year it was in San Francisco and again in Barcelona. It's been in Barcelona about four years now, I think. Yeah. Um, it represents one of the largest IT conferences, I think only overshadowed by, I believe it's the Oracle conference that is tens of hundreds of uh, uh, attendees uh, bigger. I think there was over 20,000 attendees in the US, I seem to remember, um, and over 10,000 attendees uh, yeah. in Europe. I think last year in, in Barcelona was 8,500, this year was over 10,000. Um, so it's a significant conference and uh, you know there's, there's a lot of uh, people uh, attending that and uh, get some real benefit from it. Definitely. So the conference is made up from uh, many different tracks, from the keynote presentations made by the likes of um, Pat Gelsinger or Carl Eschenbach, the CTO and, and, and people like that that are talking about the technology, but not just the technology that VMware is working on, but kind of where the industry is going. Yeah. And then outside of that, you've got the hands-on lab. So if you want to try any of the technology, understand how it would work for your business, you can go and sit in a hands-on lab. Yeah. Um, incidentally, the hands-on labs are about, I don't know, four or 500 workstations all delivered by Horizon View from data centers around the world into the Barcelona Conference Center. Um, and what's quite nice is even you watching this now can access those hands-on lab. So if you Google VMware hands-on lab or HOL, you can sign up to the hands-on labs free of charge. And then from that perspective, you can then go and try the technology, understand it a little bit more, understand what it would do for your business. Yes. We then have the, the solutions exchanges we've already spoken about, and then the smaller breakout sessions where you can get really deep about the technology, understand what's going on. Um, certainly one of the elements that I was concentrating on was the AirWatch products, the secure content locker. We're going to come into end user computing in a bit, but any particular subjects that really stood out for you? Um, I always find the, um, the solution exchange the interesting piece to see what's going on in there. I was going to say that um, this year more than most there was a lot of focus on hyper-converged computing. So you have um, you know, people like Nutanix, so you've got the, the uh, VMware's Evo Rail uh, offering there, but also lots and lots of other uh, players within that market. Um, storage, storage, I think a lot more storage vendors represented there, the traditional ones, um, you know, the, the NetApps and AMCs, um, the ones that the, the flash storage vendors um, who are doing something a bit clever like pure, uh, pure storage and nimble were having much bigger stands than they have in previous years and getting a lot of attention. Um, and I suppose the, th the third kind of key area that uh, yeah, we saw a lot of is within the software for monitoring um, VMware environments. Definitely. Um, make sure you can get the most out of your virtual environment. You've already made a big investment, so let's make sure that you're getting the most out of it and it's, it's simple and easy to manage. Yeah. So um, one of the key messages, and there was two key messages that Anthony and I, when we were discussing this earlier, thought about. One was the, the one cloud, any app, any device message. Um, and the other one was consumer simplicity versus enterprise security. So, Anthony, do you want to start talking about that one? What did that one mean to you? Um, 
Which one should I do first? The, yeah, do uh, the consumer simplicity one. So it was really this kind of, you know, the advent of apps, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail when we look at uh, some of the keynotes uh, from this event. But people want the simplicity that they get with their um, mobile phone, you know, with their iPhone, um, but they need to know that they've got a high level of security on that. I know I was just reading over lunch today um, that lots of people have fallen for this thing on uh, Facebook at the moment where they've given a, a, a company that they've never heard of the rights to search through the whole of their Facebook and work out which words they use the best and create a word cloud mm -hmm. from that. Um, uh, that's you know that's completely blown all of their Facebook security, um, and they've done it un unwittingly. We can't afford for things like that to happen in um, you know in a business environment. We can't afford for uh, uh, in, to enable people to do that. So um, yeah, the, the, the security piece has got to be very tight. And I know we'll touch on a few slides later on. It's you know. getting that careful balance between it, isn't it? And then and the other element there, the um, one cloud, uh, any app, any device, is really a uh, prominent message because all of us are looking probably at cloud technology today, software as a service. Maybe you're looking to move uh, virtual machines into something like vCloud Air or Azure or AWS. And, of course, you have your infrastructure there on site. So the one cloud piece from VMware is all about recognizing that there are multiple different cloud options but ensuring that you can manage it simply from one portal from one set of management tools rather than having disparate um, clouds as well as making their own cloud and the on-premise cloud seem as one um, and then obviously being able to use any application and any device i think one of the things that barry and i were just talking about earlier was that uh, this time last year um, we we had only an on-premise on-premise system so our accounting system was internally our help desk system was internal our crm was internal we've now got a number of software as a service elements out, which are sat in the cloud outside of the business that we need to manage as well and uh, that's you know i'm sure that many of your businesses are are the same Definitely. in that way and, and this slide really starts to bring it together where where we were and where we are now kind of thing you you knew where your infrastructure was, you knew where your virtual machines were, you knew what your users were doing. They were using your infrastructure, the, the desktop that you provided them with, um, which was all very comfortable, very easy. Um, and now we're moving to a lot more unpredictable environment. We're sharing resources with multiple different people. We're looking to have rapid change inside the infrastructure. So, and, and that's all being driven by, by software and the way that we're consuming IT today. Yeah. And, and that's proven by many different areas. So obviously we've got the, the likes of Uber um, that have really revolutionized the, the taxi industry or I don't know if revolutionized the right word. There's a lot of uproar about them. I think um, Ed Hoppet, who presented at our event, mentioned that in Barcelona, um, Uber has kind of been chucked out. They've not been allowed to compete yeah. there. But the areas they have been able to compete, they've been able to um, override the, the taxi industry. It's a lot easier. And the, how they're able to differentiate themselves is around the, the software. Um, you have an app that you're able to hail your Uber cab. Um, you can see when it's coming. You can see a picture of the driver. You're able to set where it is. You're able to pay for it on, on the iPhone. Um, one that was quite a surprise for me was uh, John Deere tractors, obviously known for making robust machinery that hopefully never fails. And, and from their perspective, where they see their future vision is around the software, understanding where the grain has been planted, understand the acidity of the soil, uh, understanding how much it needs to be watering, uh, watered and things like that. It's about having this information, the, the big data, the analytics behind it. Um, and then obviously the last one there is uh, Airbnb. Yeah. Um, so if you want to go and get a hotel room somewhere, you've just flown into Barcelona, it's quite easy now to go on Airbnb. You're not looking at the hotels, you're looking at people's houses or guest houses that they put up for rent. And the reason that we're seeing these changes is all because of software. Um, how you differentiate yourself today is via your app, via your software, by using the data in a different way. Yeah, I think that's, that's the key thing. One of the key messages of uh, VMworld was it's starting to become all about the app. It's the app that's going to make a, a, a big difference. Um, one of the guys was talking about his, his daughter, who's now 21, and has changed her bank account three times, not based on the, uh, you know, the, the facilities that the bank offers in their kind of bricks and mortar facilities, but because they'd offered functionality in their app, which had, uh, you know, she thought, I, I want that application. I want those, that functionality. I want to be able to pay my bills when I'm out and about. I want to check my balance constantly. Um, and that's why um, she changed her bank account. I, I've been, uh, I've still got the bank account I first set up when I uh, started working numerous years ago. 
and never thought of changing it. So, Definitely. Uh, and there's some great examples there on the screen. I mean, obviously, Tesla were able to send a software update the other day that improved 0 to 60 times and made the car drive itself. Yeah. Um, Nest were able to adjust sensitivity on their smoke alarms, and Apple were able to extend battery life. If we go back two, three, five years ago, being able to offer anything like that was unheard of without a, a hardware change. Um, software is changing the world that we live in. Yeah, I think uh, VW would probably regret not having, uh, so, you know, wireless enabled all their vehicles so they could update the uh, dodgy software on the emissions, um, you know, side of things. Indeed. And, and, and the real message there is how long is it going to be until your industry is revolutionized? Um, from that perspective, you might be sat there going, well, I, I, we're not an app company. We, we don't build apps. We don't build software. But how long until someone does in your industry? So it's just kind of thinking a little bit different and also changing the perspective of the IT manager. We've seen, we were talking about it earlier, the IT manager's role has been very much keeping the lights on. What we're now seeing is IT and, and software is changing the way that a company can operate. And we need to have our infrastructure simple, easy to manage, almost running itself, so the, the technical people inside the business can be helping the company understand how it can be more profitable, yeah, how it can uh, process uh, orders better, doing something to improve the customer experience and ultimately the profitability of the business. I think that's probably why there were a significant uh, increase in the number of monitoring products that were uh, on show because people just expect that infrastructure to uh, to work. They want to monitor it by exception and uh, not spend their whole life as an IT manager running around fighting fires trying to keep the uh, the infrastructure running. So on, on the other side of this, as you kind of already mentioned, is the security side. And there's some uh, examples there on screen as to some of the the, the biggest um, leaks of data, hacks of data that have happened uh, quite recently. I think with TalkTalk Talk being probably one of the most recent of those, I think they yeah. mentioned that, uh, that was it the CEO from TalkTalk Talk was sat next to a, a, a VCR and... Um, Copy of Windows XP, I think. And, and something like that. And obviously they've had £35 million uh, pounds worth of data uh, or £35 million pounds put aside just for the data leak that happened with inside their business. Um, and quite a funny story Ad, uh, Ed Hoppett said about Ashley Madison. Obviously, Ashley Madison being the site where you can go for illicit affairs, and apparently all the presentation he's given, no one's actually admitted to have their d data leaked from Ashley Madison. Yeah. But what, what you can actually see is a lot of people that were using Ashley Madison were actually using their business addresses. Um, and someone was actually able to correlate how happy employees were by how many people inside the business had actually used Ashley Madison, which I thought was yeah. quite funny. I mean, what was interesting was as, um, as Ed went around the room and mentioned the names of these companies and asked people to put their hands up if they'd been affected, you know, we had 200 people in the room. Significant number of people have been affected by these things. And I think security is, uh, is one of the biggest challenges that we have in uh, you know pushing things out to the cloud definitely and and that's where ed then came on to so so what is the more secure model if you look at the the pictures on the screen on the left we've got a hotel on the right we've got a castle and uh, you immediately think well the castle is the most secure one we've got um a, a moat around the outside we've got a drawbridge we've got turrets that have probably got cannons inside them um on the left we've got a, a plush hotel room but if we think about it in a bit more detail, this probably represents what your network looks like. On, on the edge, you've probably got firewall technology. It's probably very robust. But actually, inside your network, when someone is able to get past that outer layer, it's, it's, uh, it's soft, it's squidgy, if you, if you imagine the egg uh, analogy. On the outside, it's hard, uh, difficult to, to get into. But in the middle, it's, it's mushy and um, easy to, to, to get into. So which is where you kind of come to the hotel room that, okay, you might be able to get in the front door. You've probably got security there, but then each of the rooms have separate locks to them. So that's generally where we want your network to be. We want to be able to secure not only the outside, but the various different layers inside the network um, called micro segmentation to ensure that we have security throughout the infrastructure. And this is really where, um, you know, really was to support what um, VMware are doing with network security in that you know we're now used to uh, virtual machines and virtualizing servers um, we're getting used to uh, virtualizing storage now um, and this is the uh, their nsx product that's uh, been represented here which is how we're starting to um, to virtualize the network layer so that you know a, a virtual machine has a certain amount of uh, networking attached to it has a security profile attached to it and wherever we move that whether that be in a private cloud where you know, we move it into a public cloud um, and then that security moves with it. 
and uh, yeah, that was quite a powerful met metaphor to uh, to help us think through so how that works. I suppose from my perspective, the ideal is a hotel inside a castle. We still want that robust security on the outside, but then every single area that we're going to go into inside there, we're, we're having to go through security checks to, to get between it to, to uh, avoid us having any kind of issue uh, inside the network. So this then uh, brings us on to some of the technology updates uh, inside um, VMworld and that were discussed at our event. So a gentleman we called Darren Bird, who was the subject matter expert from uh, VMware, joined us um, at our Define Tomorrow event. And also we were talking about uh, VMworld. And we've got a number of different things uh, that happened at VMworld or happened at VMworld previously, and then there's been up updates since then. So one of those was vSphere 6. Obviously, that was announced the previous year and came live in March. So there's still yeah. quite a lot of information being discussed around it at the moment. Um, and we're at a point at the moment where it's come to maturity, where we've got customers using it in, in the wild. We've had it running in our demo environment in our labs since the day of release back in March, and it's a strong, stable release. Um, what amazed me is there were over 650 updates um, within vSphere 6, with some of those uh, on screen mentioned that really stood out uh, the most. Um, some of those are vVols, so the concept behind vVols is it's a storage technology. At the moment, generally you're managing the policy for replicating snapshots and protecting your virtual machines on a per LUN level on your Equilogic or Nimble or HP EVA, whatever that's going to be. And that's great until you potentially look to move that virtual machine into the cloud in the future. If you're not connecting those individual virtual machines with individual policy, it can be very difficult to manage them at that granular level. And if you also looked at how you're going to manage DR, generally there's going to be a backup policy there as well. So what we want to try and do is stop trying to manage policy at a storage level, at a volume level, and be wrapping that around all the virtual machines. So effectively, when you enable vVols inside vSphere, each virtual machine or each virtual machine hard disk is allocated to its own smaller data store that is automatically created by a vSphere. It talks directly to your SAN, and the SANs use, um, the vSphere uses the APIs to enable that all on the back end. Then from that perspective, you set up tiers, so maybe gold, silver, and bronze, and you say, at the gold level, we're going to replicate every 15 minutes, we're going to snapshot every hour, um, and we build up a policy. Maybe it has to be SSD, or maybe it can be a hybrid uh, tier in our array. Then as we go down, we're then able to set up the suitable different tiers inside of it. So that was a big update we saw in vSphere 6. I think the general message about vSphere 6 is, and this is, you know, as, as Barry said, we were an early adopter into our labs, and we put it through its paces. Um, we wait for, you know, we get a, a, an update to that. We try to put it onto our local, our own systems internally. But, you know, vSphere 6, from a, from a uh, end user point of view, is, is ready to go now. Incredibly stable. There is some functionality in there. You may look at it and think, you know, I don't need that functionality. But there's an awful, awful lot of um, bug fixes and, uh, as well. So um, we're, we're recommending people move to vS vSphere 6 no, uh, and we've had no, no issues in the field. No, that's it. And, and it, it's something that w the way that a computer will do it is we'll understand your environment. We'll understand the components within your side your environment. It's very important that we've checked the hardware compatibility lists to ensure all the components inside your infrastructure are going to support vSphere 6. And then we also uh, need to look at the software components, maybe using Veeam, maybe using Site Recovery Manager. Or maybe you have something like um, Horizon View for VDI desktops. So we'll work with you to understand your environment and then set up a, a custom plan to get you to vSphere 6. The important aspect is it's a very easy upgrade to happen. It doesn't take too long, um, and it sh there should be no reason why it would result in any business downtime. It can all be done during the working day using technologies like high availability and vMotion to move virtual machines around. We would then look to delay things like SAN firmware updates they might want to do at the same time into a point where we can do that with there's less risk involved yeah okay so the, the other element on top of uh, vSphere 6 was around vRealize operations. What, what stood out to you about uh, Darren's um, presentation on vRealize operations? I think I, vRealize operations is something that's been around for a while now. I've looked at some of the earlier versions of it. It's, it's there now, a, bit, a little bit like we're saying with vSphere 6. It, it is really there now. It is a, a technology that allows you to manage your environment by exception. Um, it sits there for the first 30 days and learns your environment. It learns the kind of heartbeat of what's going on in your organization. Um, if, a, you know, a, if you've got a VM that you only use every Friday to do your invoice run, um, then it'll get used to the fact that, that uh, there'll be a lot of activity on Friday on that VM. Um, and uh, a lot of the, uh, the rest of the time it's, it's sit looking dormant. Um, 
that it, it's a superb bit of software. The interface is great. It's well worth having a look at. And there are some uh, evaluation programs that will enable you to do that. There's a definitely the OA um, piece. I uh, thoroughly recommend you you take a look at that because uh, I think it, it could change the way in which you're um, you're managing your environment. One of the really nice pieces in it is the fact that it will look at your environment and it will start to look for um, where you you've over specified. Uh, servers. So if you've allocated too much memory to a server and it's a virtual server and it's never been used, it will recommend you reduce that. If a server could benefit from an additional CPU, um, then it will recommend that as well. And uh, it gives you a very nice holistic view of what's going on in your environment. Definitely. And as, as you mentioned there, we can do a VOA assessment. That's free of charge for anyone that's watching. Um, what we'll do is we'll install a trial copy of the Realize Operations. Yep. We will let that run for a period of time and we'll create you, I believe it's seven reports. Those seven reports will report on how healthy your environment is, how you can maybe get some capacity back inside your infrastructure, as well as maybe other tweaks and improvements that you could make. Um, after those 30 days, th there's no charge. You get the reports. If you don't want to purchase the Realize Operations, there's no requirement to do so. Um, so it just gives you a good uh, opportunity to be able to look at that. A couple of uh, features that really stood out to me in the latest version were around the, the smart alerts that yeah. allow you to understand the root cause of what's going on. So maybe you've got high latency, but actually it's being caused by a virtual machine that is consuming a lot more IOPS than it normally would do. Um, and the other one is automated remediation. So maybe there's a recommendation to lower the amount of CPUs in a VM from two to one. Yeah. There's a button that will actually go and do that for you so you don't have to even go and do those steps yourself. So it's a very powerful piece of software. Yeah. So vCloud Air, I don't know, um, you know how many people have, uh, have looked at this in any detail, but you know, in, in a quick summary, vCloud Air is, is, a, you know, is an extension of your data center that's operated from your v um, from your vCenter. It looks like your environment, but it sits in VMware's um, cloud. It sits um, in the UK in, in a data center uh, near Bracknell. Um, and it gives you three clear, clear areas in, in which you could work. You could move a workload to that environment permanently. So you've got um, you know, really good guaranteed SLAs around that. Uh, and you know you've got um, you know the power sorted. It would be you put an environment there that you really need to keep up 24/7. The second way in which you could use it is if you need some additional capacity within your environment. So it just seamlessly links with your um, uh, your own private cloud in-house, um, and you've got that ability to uh, in Actuate with vSphere 6 to do a long-distance vMotion and move a machine from your environment into that cloud environment while it's still running. Um, generally. Uh, up until now, we've moved uh, VMs across there um, in while, while they've been powered down. And I, th I think that was an, an impressive thing at VMworld where they showed that technical preview to allow you to move that. I mean, that's the first time we've been able to see a technology yeah. like that extend from just your data center. And you can use that in, in a number of different ways. Today, it's, it's readily available inside vSphere 6 to allow you to move a virtual machine between two data centers, two vCenters, and then obviously the, the tech preview to them that will bring that to vCloud Air in the future. Yeah, and the third area is, is DR, having that ability to um, replicate your machines into that cloud um, and to be able to power those on and bring them up in an in a instance of a uh, disaster um, is a very powerful feature. And uh, VMware seem to be, you know, encouraging that. The pricing for that is is very very favourable, uh, and it gives you an option for DR, which doesn't mean you have to have another dedicated data centre within your organisation somewhere. Definitely. Yeah. We, we've got a, um, a webinar happening in December with a vCloud Air specialist. Um, so if you think that there may be an opportunity to use some cloud technology inside your infrastructure, you're looking at DR options, maybe you've got a test and dev workload that you really need to spin up somewhere else, I recommend that you join that. There's a link at the end where you can sign up to all the webinars we're going to be offering. So next uh, came to end-user computing, which I joined um, my, my fellow author, Peter Von Oven. We've uh, wrote a book together. Um, he's, he's gone over some of the books I've read, and, and equally I'm reviewing some of the books for him at the moment. Um, and end-user computing is something that really I'm quite passionate about, because if we look at the changes that have happened with end-user computing, so we're, we're not just talking about VDI here. We're talking about what's going on inside your infrastructure. Um, the users were just using... PCs that you provided them using the software that you were providing them. And that was probably the most advanced technology that they, they had in their life. Maybe they had a, a PC at home that they went up into the back bedroom and checked their email on once a week, but otherwise they were coming into work to use technology. 
if we look where we are today, they probably have a mobile phone in their pocket that is more powerful than the PC they had back then. They're probably carrying a tablet around with them. Their home, P, uh, home PC or laptop probably has SSDs in it, is a lot more powerful than what you're providing on the desk today. So we're seeing a radical shift, and then we come back to the software. They're used to being able to download applications and updates to uh, the operating system and the application on demand, and they're probably not even aware that, that they're available to them. Yet in the enterprise, you're probably still rolling out a machine, updating it when it next goes wrong. Software may get updated, or maybe using that thing called Wussus to try and keep it updated, but actually when was the last time it worked? It's very difficult to try and deliver that really seamless uh, experience that the users have come to expect. Um, so what we need to be able to do is we need to be able to deliver that consumer simplicity. We need to be able to keep the security aspect of it. But we also need to allow the users to work in the ways that they want to be able to use, using applications that can be supported by the business um, and in a mobile fashion. At the end of the day, we shouldn't be confined to the, the four walls of the office to use your business applications anymore. You this should is, I mean, this is one of, the, one of the key messages around, around this, is this any device piece. I want to be able to start a, a bit of work on my desktop PC and then move it to my iPad and then potentially take it to my phone and uh, you know maybe if that's a presentation show it to a client on their screen driven by uh, my phone. Definitely. So, so what we're seeing from um, VMware's perspective is there are a number of different technologies now included in VMware's end user computing suite and the real aim is to deliver that, that business mobility. So we've obviously got VMware Horizon View. Um, we're able to virtualize near enough every single desktop workload that you have today. So even if you've got CAD users, um, the, the latest one that I've seen is digital dictate. Di dig digital dictation that's yeah. often used in the legal sector. Um, it's re been a real stumbling block to get those um, uh, Philips dictation machines used with big hand yep. inside a VDI desktop. That's now supported today as well. Um, so any kind of workloads we can deliver with VDI, but that isn't the only technology we've got. So we've got Mirage that is able to manage your physical desktops, manages them at a per block level. Uh, we're able to upgrade from XP to Windows 7 seamlessly. So from that perspective, it's very uh, quick, very easy. You don't, users don't have to come off of the machines to allow them to be able to do that. Um, we're able to back up the data inside um, the desktops. Yep. Um, so if you unfortunately leave your uh, laptop on the train, hopefully it's already encrypted and that isn't the problem. The next problem is how do we get the managing director's data back that was on his laptop? How do we make sure he can continue doing what he's doing? So Mirage is always running in the background, upgrading um, uh, the applications, upgrading the operating system, protecting the data. We then have devices. So if we look at uh, people that are using iPads, tablets, mobile phones, VMware purchased AirWatch 18 months ago for £1.8 billion, I think it was. Yeah. And we're able to uh, protect, secure, lock down, uh, issue policy around that. And, and Microsoft were on stage with VMware at VMware talking about Windows 10 uh, that now has integration. That's, that's the first time we've seen that. I mean, what, what are your customers looking at when it comes to end user computing? I think. Um most of my clients have got an unmanaged kind of desktop environment at the moment, um, and they don't really understand the real, the key benefits of, uh, of VDI um, and of end user computing as a whole. A lot of you know, people come to me and say, we want to look at a VDI project, and it always ends up as a, an end user computing project, because when we start to do a desktop assessment, we find out there's a number of devices out there that just really aren't suitable for mm -hmm. VDI, and that's where the Mirage piece kicks in. Um, I think you know when one of the, the key things that we always look at is when you're starting to move platforms. When as soon as you've moved to a uh, an end user computing environment, when you when we look at whether we're going to move to Windows 10 or not, um, you know moving from Windows 7 to Windows 10 is such an easy thing to do once you've got that managed desktop mm -hmm. environment. Um, we start to then look at how diff how we can use different ways to uh, to sh move the data around within that environment. And there are various other bits of the uh, the VMware portfolio that enable us to do that. Mm. Then we look at how we manage those end user devices, which is where the AirWatch piece it, it comes becomes in. very powerful, and the uh, the secure content locker pieces. And then the secure, secure content locker I mentioned at the beginning was something that really stood out to me. And and what this allows you to do is offer a, a Dropbox like service for your business that allows your users to share and collaborate files, but still allows IT to control who has access to them. Uh, where they're allowed access to them. So you could set that they're allowed full edit permissions when they're in the office, when they're out of the office, then maybe they're only allowed read only. We can make sure we stamp their name across documents. So even if they take a, a screenshot or a picture uh, with their phone or on the photocopier, 
we still know who took that screenshot and what was going on. Um, so as technology, we're seeing quite a lot of interest into at the moment. And, and a piece you said there about VDI isn't always the right option is, is really true. Whilst we can now generally uh, turn any desktop, any workload into a VDI workload, it doesn't mean it's always the right decision. So we need to look at why are we looking at VDI desktops? How old are the machines they're using? Will they ever need to use their machine in what we call island mode? So maybe they're working on the train. You really don't want a VDI desktop to do that. You're going to be dropping the connection too often. Yeah, I think what we've seen um, with VMware on the end user computing piece is some very strong acquisitions. So they bought uh, a product which is now, I always forget the name of this one, but it's now become uh, UEM, Unified mm -hmm. Environment Manager, um, and that has uh, re completely revolutionized the way in which we deploy um, profiles. It's given us a lot of options there um, for managing the yeah, VDI profiles. Um, and then AppVols, which uh, is a very powerful product. I don't know if you want to say a few words about yeah. those two. So, so both of those products, UEM and AppVols, maybe you're, you're sat there, maybe you're a Citrix house, both of those technologies they don't matter alongside Horizon Workspace what technology you're using, whether you're using Citrix or whether you're using VMware. They clearly work very well with VMware, and, and VMware would prefer that you came over to the VMware camp for those technologies. What AppVols is able to do is it's able to deliver applications on demand to a desktop. So from a user perspective, as they're logging in, they're actually logging into a pretty vanilla desktop that's the same as any other desktop. But actually, as they go through that login process, the applications are dynamically layered down onto the desktop just in time. Yeah. So all of a sudden, that desktop has got the uh, Microsoft Visio that they need to use on it. It's got the accounting package that they need to use on it. But then what we're also able to do is we're able to deploy new applications just as quickly. You can, in fact, deploy new applications whilst the user is still logged into the machine. It doesn't need to install that application. It connects a virtual disk to it, and that application is then merged with the underlying image, and it's readily available as soon as that disk is connected. Now, ultimately, what this means, if you've looked at VDI projects before, it's a lot easier to package the application. So previously, we've looked at technologies like FinApp, to be able to package the applications. And yeah. FinApp is a very good technology, but it can be quite long and quite cumbersome to get your applications into that virtualized state. With AppVolves, it's a very uh, very vanilla native uh, process to actually package the applications into these AppVolves. Bring that together with UEM, so their persona is layered on just as they get in. It means that we've got this technology of just-in-time desktops. We don't have to have images that are specific to departments or specific to people. We can have a very small amount of images on the back end. I've got two VDI projects I'm working on at the moment, and both of those have been revolutionised, you know, and simplified significantly by those two, um, you know, those two products. Um, so that kind of brings us on to um, how do you define tomorrow? And, and we had two note, keynote speakers at the event. We've obviously spoke about Ed Hoppet from VMware and what he spoke about. The other one was a gentleman called Tim Griffin from Dell. He's UK CEO. So it, it was quite an honor to be able to have two very prestigious speakers. And Dell have been going through a large amounts of changes inside the organization. They've obviously gone from floating on the stock market to a private organization. Yep. What really drove them to do that is the mass change of what's happening in IT today. We're seeing a mass shift towards the cloud, towards software rather than hardware, um, and they needed to be able to go behind closed doors out of that gaze of its shareholders to allow them to restructure and look at technology. I was able to attend uh, an event from Dell earlier on this year, and it was actually uh, quite impressive to understand how they are focusing on that whole solution sale, uh, being able to provide all of the components in the IT infrastructure uh, to, for the end users with the expertise, make sure they've got best of breed products. Obviously, whilst we were out at Barcelona, it was announced that Dell um, had uh, launched an intent to buy EMC and ultimately gain the majority share in VMware as well. And that's going to help them further bolster what they're doing. I think it takes them up to somewhere like 26 uh, leading technologies in the top right of the Gartner Magic Quadrant, which is really quite impressive. Um, and it's going to be quite interesting to see how that, that changes change uh, comes about over the next uh, few years. We've obviously seen Dell be very familiar with the acquisition model over the years with um, Equilogic, with Sonic Wool, with Force 10, mm -hmm. Compellent. So they've got a very mature model, but this is the biggest ever technology merger as far as I'm aware. Yeah, and I think they've been very clear, and Tim was very clear on uh, uh, at the event that you know VMware is going to be held as a separate organization. It's still going to remain uh, kind of hardware agnostic. They're not going to just uh, try and integrate it into uh, their product set, um, and they will they will keep that and manage that. I think that is probably the jewel in the crown for them as an organisation. But they know that they need to uh, to look after that so. very carefully. 
but the, their key message was firstly the, the piece that you know they, they're a privately owned company so they don't answer to any shareholders they answer to their customers um, that was their view and they now have a complete end-to-end -end solution um, you know through they, they I think uh, Tim said they just discovered they're the largest IT security company in uh, in the um, you know in the world purely because of uh, one of the companies that they've acquired. Well, they've, got, they've got Dell SecureWorks already that they acquired, yep. I think it was last year, but obviously they've now got RSA coming in as part of that family, as part of the EMC group, as well as a number of other technologies well, I'm sure. So uh, it's very impressive. We'll see what happens with that. But I, I was also interested whilst at the conference to understand what the, the people that were speaking, that, that were there um, exhibiting, how, what do they see IT looking like in the future? What was their advice to you? Um, and one of the people that I was, I was extremely honored to be able to speak to was Pat Gelsinger himself, the, the CEO of VMware. Um, I'm a leader for the, the VMware user group in Bristol, and I was invited to a meal along with the other VMUG leaders. And what Pat Gelsinger said was, looking into the industry, looking to the future, um, they believe between 2020 and 2030, at least 50% of your workload will be in the cloud. Now, to me, that kind of surprised me from, from two sides. Where one was, wow, 50% of my workload will be in the cloud. And the other was, oh, only 50% of my workload will be in the cloud. So it's very much a, a hybrid vision, looking after your data center and making that simple, easy to manage, reporting for itself. Even self-healing in some ways in the future is going to be ultimately important so we can look at the bigger picture of the cloud and what is your cloud strategy I think any organization today that doesn't have a cloud strategy risks um, what we call shadow IT this is the users the, the people inside your organization making decisions to put their credit card into some software as a service application or some other platform and move your customers data to the cloud without IT knowing yeah it's the old thing where you know, often when we do a desktop assessment and we look at an organization, we find out most of the business is actually being run on a pile of spreadsheets, nowhere near their core business systems. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it can be very similar with this now that, you know, it's not an Excel spreadsheet that they're running their business on. It's a software as a service thing that they, you know, a couple of people in the department have gone online, given a credit card number and, uh, um, you know, and, and set up the system. And the IT manager is blissfully unaware that company confidential data is in a cloud that uh, may, may be well secured, may not be well secured. Um, and although he's religiously doing his backups every night, he's not capturing that uh, element of the data and that crit business critical uh, data. And, and, and that is a, a common theme. So I was lucky enough to speak to, um, I think it was a gentleman, the head of marketing for Convo. And one of the elements that I raised with him is one of the, the biggest problems that I see is when organizations move their workloads to the cloud, they believe their data is protected. They no longer need to think about DR or backup or anything like that yeah. because it's in the cloud. Now, that's probably one of the most common misconceptions. A, they might not be backing it up. It might not be part of your agreement. It might not have DR on it as standard. But even if it does, does it meet your standards? Does it meet what you have documented to protect your data? And what happens if that cloud service went down? How are you then going to restore that data elsewhere? And I was pleased to see that Commvault had started looking at that. They're offering services, I think, for salesforce.com already, as well as Office 365. But the future for those vendors really is how do we make tools that allow us to back up data in software as a service applications and allow you to restore them to another similar service. So it's not just a backup and recovery. It's a backup conversion and recovery. I think that's important. It's, it's like we talk about, uh, and I think VMware had this as their strap line at one point, that, you know, the journey to the cloud. You've also got to consider how you exit. Yeah. on the cloud when you need to when maybe the uh, you know the cloud service you've signed up with um, becomes less competitive and you need to move to another one you need to make sure your data is not locked in there in such a proprietary way that you can never get it out and i think this is why we're seeing the rise of uh, technologies like containers now i'm not going to get into this too deep now but i was speaking yeah. to a gentleman uh, who is cto for amir called joe bagley um, and what containers allow you to do is effectively encapsulate an application that may be being developed inside your business into a very thin linux Esque virtual machine called a container. It's really cut down. Doesn't have a full operating system. It just has the uh, the languages that you're coding against available inside of it. Now. The other way you could do that is platform as a service. So you could go on Azure and write your application on Azure as a platform as a service directly against .NET or something like that. The problem is then you have tied yourself into .NET on Azure because you wrote your application around it. Whereas a container allows you that same flexibility to be writing your applications around the underlying language 
but ultimately you could go and move that from the various different cloud providers. And VMware have understood that, they're seeing that, they're, they're building technology to support containers. So I don't think a large amount of our customers are going to be looking at containers today. If it is something you're interested in and want me to uh, run through the technologies available, then uh, send us a message and we can go through that. I think it just supports that one cloud, you know, any device, any application, you know, any application, any device piece that's really where the whole industry is heading definitely so so while we were at our event uh, we spoke to a number of the sponsors and asked them how do they define tomorrow so head over to the blog you'll see a few videos there that kind of give you um, some fresh ideas as to how our, our sponsors our vendors our partners are advising their customers look to the future so if we kind of sum up um, some of the elements that we um, have seen and, and discussed at VMworld and at our event, um, the first one is how long is it until your uh, industry is revolutionized and what are you going to do to make sure you're revolutionizing it? it? It's something that not everybody will be able to be involved in, but it's important to understand what could be coming and, and what could take out a large part of um, uh, your revenue and, and, and your customer base. And probably one of the questions that um, came out of VMworld was, just this, the, you know, ask yourself the question as IT manager, you know, how can I gain competitive advantage in my company by exposing some of my core business systems to my users? You know, it, you, you'll see people like DHL, you know, when they deliver a parcel to me, I now have to sign on a little, um, you know, on, on the device there. The moment I do that, they've got a proof delivery available to the, uh, the guy who sent the parcel to me. In the past, that would be a massive paper chain. I know I, I got involved with some document scanning and stuff like that probably 10 or 15 years ago to try and uh, you know sort out that bit for a haulage company. Um, now it's instantaneous. I don't know if, if you know how many people remember this, but Bill Gates um, wrote a book called Business at the Speed of Thought in 1999. If uh, I grabbed my copy off the shelf and started reading it again, and he did, he was quite a visionary mm -hmm. when it came to this. He was talking about reducing the cost of transactions in a business by exposing the core business systems to the end users and that's years ahead of when actually that's that's a real kind of possibility and it is reality now and it goes to that big data at the end of the day organizations keep mass loads of data but are you using that data to help you get that competitive advantage yeah. at the end of the day if we can get that data to the right people at the right time that's where you get your advantage from and that's where the advantage comes from software yeah. um, and, and that kind of brings the next ad adage saying taking no risk is, is the biggest risk of all you need to put your neck out there and, and try something to remain competitive inside the industry um, the next one is then kind of concentrating on what you're doing as IT managers as IT professionals what, what is going to matter is what is your cloud adoption plan? What are you planning to, to uh, do in the future? What technology are you looking at and how is it going to be able to help your business? Again, if you're not doing it, Shadow IT is going to be taking over. Yeah. Um, so the next one, you're probably already licensed for vSphere 6, for the latest updates to your SAN, Veeam and things like that. So are you up to date? Are you making use of those technologies? Are they on the most stable version? When you call VMware up, are you confident that the question, that the first point they're not going to say to you is, well, you're not on the latest version. We recommend you get up to that and that's going to solve this problem. So that would be one of the things that I'd recommend that everyone goes away, considers where they are um, and looks to see where they need to be in terms of upgrades for their infrastructure. Um, and then isn't it about time you re reviewed your end user computing and maybe uh, collaboration uh, solutions? So how are your employees talking to each other? How are they engaging with each other? How are they sharing content? How are they working on the road? Are you making the most effective use uh, of the employee's time to be able to get them to make the most of uh, money for your business and to be most uh, productive for your business? Yeah, and there's been a, there's an ongoing joke in the IT industry about you know next year will be the uh, the year of VDI. I think we've skipped that completely. End user computing, you know, we now have the technology to, technologies to deliver real competitive advantage and real cost savings into an organisation through deploying an end user computing uh, environment. And uh, you know, if you've not considered that then you really should start to, uh, to look at that now. So uh, a couple of things before we go on to, I think we've got a few questions. Um, so the URL on the screen, defintomorrow.co.uk forward slash VM event, um, will get you to a page of offers, um, free downloads, 
um, information that you can make the most of. Um, this was offered to everyone at the event, and we will also put a link on there to all the videos from the event. So we've got keynote uh, speeches, we've got a wrap-up from the event, and we've got how do you define tomorrow uh, on there as well. Um, I would certainly recommend um, Ed Hoppet, who is a, a CTO ambassador from uh, um, VMware. It's worth the 20 minutes just to, to listen to his talk. Just to, It's very thought-provoking. Um, so, yeah, thoroughly recommend that one. Fantastic. Um, so, uh, have we got any questions from anyone in the audience? Tim Longbotham from Moog has asked, do we need vSphere 6 for vSphere Realize Ops? Um, a good question there, Tim. So, from that perspective, uh, no, you don't need vSphere 6. You can be on any of the previous versions. I think it supports anywhere back to version 4 or maybe earlier. Um, there may be some functionality to get the most out of it. You would need vSphere 6, but it's, it's not a definitive requirement. And Daniel Smith from Davies and Partners has said, would vSphere Realize help him look at what the replacement server is required? Yeah, so that's a, that's a really good question. So what I'd highly recommend is uh, if you uh, give us a call or, or speak to your account manager, we can run something called the VOA assessment that I mentioned yeah. earlier, free of charge to you. We'll get uh, vRealize operation inside your environment, and that will help us look at your environment, understand your server that needs replacing, what does it need replacing with, um, maybe does it need replacing. If you've got a large amount of servers in your infrastructure, we might be able to right-size the infrastructure to uh, actually use less resource. Um, again, it's free of charge to speak to your computer or account manager. So I think that's all the questions that we've got for today. I hope you found uh, this short webinar useful. We've got a number of different webinars uh, coming up covering the different technologies in depth over the coming uh, days uh, and weeks. Um, so if you head over to the defineTomorrow.co.uk forward slash VM event, all of the uh, sign-ups for the future webinars that are going to be a lot more technical, digging into uh, the individual technologies uh, are listed on there. So thank you very much for watching. Thank you.